Okay. Hello, everyone. Mic seems to be working, and you hear me well, right? Okay. Do you guys have a good lunch? So, yes. Who is uh, came here to take a nap? Anybody brave enough to raise a hand? No? No one? Well, anyway, uh, then we'll get started with presentation. And uh, you know what? I want you to make me oh, one promise. Can you do that? Like, if you spot a mistake in my slides, please, please just stand up and say, Peter, this is the biggest bullshit I ever heard. OK? You promised. I remember that. Well, and uh, I will start with uh, their uh, big picture for the context of uh, uh, of this presentation, which is about uh, running uh, databases on uh, Kubernetes. Now, if you think about the big uh, hyperscale cloud providers, how do they want us to run databases? Well, typically, that is not on the Kubernetes, right? They would like the, to use their very much proprietary database as a service solution, right? Being that something like DynamoDB, which is proprietary, or maybe something like Amazon Aurora, right, which is based on open source but with a lot of bells and whistles, so that is uh, proprietary too, right? And uh, what comes with that, of course, is we are getting the great usability for that software. It's very easy. It's very easy to deploy and manage some database in many cases, right? But of course, that uh, comes up with a great uh, uh, great cost. And I don't just mean what these are more expensive in terms of dollars, right? But you have to uh, lose some of your freedoms, right? You are now locked in in that particular, uh, particular cloud. Now, what is interesting, uh, for me, somebody who has been in the open source space now for, uh, for more than 20 years, that reminds me the times when I was starting with open source development, right? Sometime maybe in, you know, early uh, 2000, right? We had uh, some, you know, Windows developers with, you know, ASP.NET or whatever Windows stuff was at that time, right? And they would tell us how amazing development tools they have, right? You know, like uh, uh, compared to us, the open source guys would be using VI, or maybe some smarter ones would be using Emacs, uh, uh, right? Like, well, but uh, it was not uh, particularly uh, that kind of experience. But guess what? Right now, if you are uh, if you are using the uh, open source uh, programming languages, frameworks, and so on and so forth, which are well probably most frameworks out there those days, you have a fantastic development tools, right? And I think we are in a kind of similar situation right now when it comes to the cloud, where you can be looking at this kind of very well integrated uh, uh, so solution from Amazon and other clouds. Right, uh, where the open source solutions have yet uh, a lot to, uh, to catch up. Another example also in, uh, in my career is Linux versus Solaris. Remember about the same time, maybe kind of late 90s, I was starting uh, working with Linux, and then a bunch of my friends were working with uh, real operating systems, right? HPUX. Solaris, AIX, right? And Linux, of course, was a joke, right? It was 32 bits, right? It didn't scale with multiple CPUs well. Like, well, if some of you remember, it couldn't even create a file more than two gigabytes in size, right? Remember those times? Oh my gosh, that was, uh, uh, that was a joke. Uh, well, but guess what? Now, it took, uh, of course, some time, but anybody still running Solaris here? No, well. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but lo locally on my old um, system, I can work for some company, so. Oh, I see, I see. I never want to say, say, but forgive me, I'm working at museum, right? I thought that's what you're going to say. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, the, the fact is what Linux became, you know, absolutely uh, ubiquitous, uh, overtaken in, uh, 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 across many dimensions, the uh, proprietary operating systems, which uh, uh, you know, pretty much uh, uh, died off, right, on uh, the uh, infrastructure side, right? And I think that is something what we are uh, also going to see uh, happening more and more on their, uh, the cloud infrastructure size uh, as well, because, well, 
uh, uh, guess what, right? Lock in sucks. Now, uh, in, uh, uh, in my presentation, I focus uh, a lot on, uh, on Kubernetes, right? And uh, I wanted to, to maybe share my observation, very, uh, which was very interesting for me attending uh, this conference, right? Is how interesting the Kubernetes uh, and the OpenStack intervene, right? I knew for years what some people are using the Kubernetes, oh, using uh, OpenStack as the deployment for Kubernetes, right? Like if you have your own cloud, which may be open source based, and if you are, uh, if you are uh, focusing on uh, or, you know, Kubernetes applications, containerized applications, you, you can use open source as a base, right? But it was interesting to see what there are also solutions where which allows you to get the OpenStack uh, deployment on a Kubernetes. And I quite didn't quite understand it if you deploy the OpenStack on a Kubernetes, can you then deploy Kubernetes inside that OpenStack environment, right? And how many times you can do that? I think that uh, would be an uh, interesting uh, uh, thing to uh, experiment with. But anyway, whatever choice in particular uh, you are uh, making in this case, whether it's uh, OpenStack uh, or Kubernetes using as a foundation of your cloud, I think what is uh, fantastic uh, in uh, uh, this case is what that really allows us to uh, uh, look at the cloud in terms of uh, uh, as a commodity, right? Really as Amazon uh, used to talk about that. For many organizations, indeed, it is not very uh, practical to build and operate your own data centers, right? And in fact, many of those cloud vendors provide us with uh, commodity infrastructure where you can, you know, get VMs like or bare metal through API, right, for us to use. Uh, that is fantastic, right? But I think it is a smarter choice, better choice to use uh, their majority of value, which comes with open source software. Again, whatever your choice of that uh, uh, infrastructure is. And that is really that time which compares to electricity as those guys uh, uh, talk about here. Right, because if you think about electricity, it is indeed commodity. You can get it from any vendor, right? You can buy your own generator, and you know what? Your TV, your fridge still works. Compare that to, you know, Amazon experience, right? Or GCP, Azure, you name it, where you can say, well, you know what? If you want to have your fridge, your TV, your microwave, you only have to buy electricity from us. Well, doesn't make much sense, right, in, uh, in this case. Well. Now let's talk about uh, their uh, Kubernetes and why uh, I believe that is uh, uh, very uh, helpful, wonderful, and getting uh, a lot of traction. The thing of Kubernetes is what well, that is uh, easily uh, available hmm, everywhere. You can see, of course, Kubernetes uh, on the edge, right? You can deploy it on your own a laptop. It's also available in a, a managed from, for, from all the majority of the clouds. It was interesting to see, for example, the Amazon, which initially had their own kind of container engine, right? Well, that's kind of all uh, but died off with uh, majority of use coming from uh, managed Kubernetes uh, service uh, out there. Now, Kubernetes and databases, in certain case, uh, uh, you may think would not quite mix because Kubernetes was designed initially for Stateless, uh, uh, stateless applications, and that is uh, uh, that is indeed true, right? And because of that, that reputation, what Kubernetes cannot do state, I think, followed that for uh, a number of uh, years. But uh, as I will show you some stats, I think the situation is uh, significantly changing right now, and we can see a lot of uh, people running data-intensive applications on Kubernetes quite successfully. To the point, what we even have the special community for folks who are running data-intensive applications on Kubernetes, right? DOK, you know, community for uh, data on hmm, Kubernetes. Now, and I wanted to share some of the stats from uh, that uh, uh, community, which I think is uh, quite interesting. Like here are uh, the stats uh, of. Uh, 
uh, uh, from their you know, community members, uh, right in this case, which you can see a very significant number of them is, uh, is running uh, their data intensive workloads on Kubernetes. But what is more important, quite happy about that, right? We don't uh, see a lot of people. Uh, oh, no, sorry, there is a, uh, uh, and expect that to increase, uh, increase their use. But of course, when you are pooling your own community, right, it's kind of, uh, you know, not very representative, right? If you, uh, you know, ask whatever, uh, right, how many vegetarians are vegetarians, right? Like, oh, how many vegetarians don't eat meat? Well, the, the response would be pretty, uh, pretty mm, obvious, right? But, um, what is interesting in this case is what uh, uh, most of the folks among those systems are quite satisfied how those uh, things are uh, working out for them in uh, Kubernetes. Here is another survey which I find interesting. This one comes from a CNCF that is a foundation behind the Kubernetes, right? So they don't have that specific bias for data intensive applications. And what you can see here is what their uh, databases and the message queues, right, which are also data intensive applications. They are some of the fastest growing uh, applications which are being deployed on, uh, on Kubernetes, right? So that is uh, uh, quite uh, cool. Here is uh, specific data intensive applications uh, which people uh, see deployed on the Kubernetes. And you can see where databases, analytics, you know, AI, machine learning stuff, right? Those are kind of, you see, like a big foundational data uh, applications like other top three, right? Of course, followed by some other like persistent storage and, and others. Now, how do you run uh, the database on Kubernetes? And I think what has been the foundational change which came about over the last uh, few years? And these are concept of the operator in Kubernetes. Right. What is the operator? Uh, if you uh, don't know, right, that is the, uh, the piece of software which can act in a similar concept as a, let's say, human operator would uh, do uh, managing that, uh, uh, that system. Right? Just all in an automated way. Why this is important for uh, databases? Well, because uh, databases typically are uh, quite complicated. Right? If you want, for example, to uh, do something with databases, right? saying, hey, you know, just uh, rolling restart, killing pods one by one, and restarting them, that may not be the best way to keep your database uh, uh, available. Right? Or you may have a special process which is needed to upgrade the database to the new version, as well as troubleshoot if something gets, gets wrong, with an update, because when we have, a, uh, we have a databases, we cannot just say, oh, you know what? Uh, if it didn't work out, we can just you know, uh, rebuild it from scratch. Well, you can, but you all lose your data. And you know what? Data is what the database is all about, right? What I think is wonderful about the Kubernetes uh, operators is what they focus both on a day one and day two uh, automation. One thing, of course, if operators, you can uh, n deploy your database clusters, right, or even kind of like a sharded clusters on, uh, uh, you know, many uh, tens, maybe kind of hundreds of uh, instances very easily, right? It really is much, much faster compared to this kind of a legacy old ways, you know, installing things from packages, right? Uh, uh, right. But what I think is much more wonderful and important is the day two automation. Right? You can find, uh, I think, uh, many, uh, in the early days of Kubernetes, there have been many people using, let's say, Helm for database automations. And, oh, look at that. I got a database deployed. It's saying, well, so what? Maybe if you're using that for CI CD, that is good enough, right? Because CI CD databases, we can always recreate them from scratch, right? Well, or, or in many cases, you can. Now, production database, they spend probably 99.9% .9 of their life in day two. Right? You expect to deploy a production database cluster, and then that's going to live out there for years, even for decades. Right? It's better to be you know, not going down. Right? And in many modern applications, we operate you know, with a 24 by 7 internet. Right? We don't really like maintenance windows that much. Right? And uh, with that, I think it's very uh, important of your day two 
uh, processes uh, is solid, and that means it's better if they're automated because, well, hopefully, if a code is right, then uh, machines make uh, less mistakes uh, than people. Now, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, what uh, uh, the, a lot of things with operators are quite easy, and I wrote this little uh, uh, blog post which shows how easy to do certain things, right, Com uh, with, a, uh, with a cluster, with the help of a, uh, uh, of a mini cube, right, if you have been using, you know, MySQL or any kind of other database, you can get a good feel uh, and maybe uh, become the, uh, you know, Kubernetes uh, convert. Another interesting thing with Kubernetes is if you look at a lot of modern database as a service solutions, they are tend to be based on uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, behind, right? And um, uh, uh, because uh, that, well, uh, makes a lot of things uh, easy in building a database, uh, database uh, uh, as a service, right? And what that means for us is what actually that is a very well tested in practice, right? I don't have access to the internal numbers, but we are speaking probably about uh, millions of instances, right, which are running uh, uh, right now of a database in, uh, in Kubernetes, right? And we don't hear like, oh my gosh, it's all, you know, going to hell uh, every day, right? So if you know how to do it, then uh, you can probably be quite successful with that. Okay. With that very uh, long uh, uh, intro, right, but hopefully uh, uh, helpful for some folks, so let's talk about some of the uh, best practices, right, what we can see. Well, pretty basics, but you know what? In many cases you get, uh, the, you have this, you know, 80, 20 rules of price, like, and following the best practices is, uh, is the most important uh, ones, right? It's like you often hear about security, right? Why people get, you know, hacked over and over again? Well, because they have a passwords on a, on a postal note, right? Basic things, but <laughs> uh, happen so, so many, uh, so uh, frequently. So number one, as we discussed, the operators are wonderful. All right, uh, uh, if you're deploying database on Kubernetes, you want to deploy that by use of an operator which can manage that for you, not just something which simplifies installation and say, hey, you know what, you are uh, on your own. Unless, of course, you know, just uh, you don't really care about database space and just throwing away and reinstalling maybe for testing that works for you. Well, uh, the second one is you want to make sure you have a high viability setup for your database. Because reality is in how Kubernetes works and in general, uh, you know, stability of that environment, you uh, do not want to be relying just on one database never going out, right? Like, I mean, uh, there should not be pets <laughs> in, uh, in Kubernetes and that applies to the databases uh, as well. Number three, you want to keep persistent data persistent, obviously. Uh, right, but the thing is, uh, in a Kubernetes, right, as an also like in Docker concept before, that was a very, very common issue when people just, you know, deploy the container without uh, some external volume and have that kind of wonderful database which works well until uh, uh, that port is destroyed with, uh, or, or Docker container destroyed, right, with all the data, right? Make sure you use, uh, uh, you know, lo uh, uh, local disks uh, can be, you know, wonderful, especially if a database handles uh, replication on its own, uh, right, or some uh, fast remote storage. The next rule is you want to keep a data per pod small. Right now, if you have your PostgreSQL database, which is a 50 terabytes in size, right, and it's, you know, one massive instance, well, maybe you don't want to move it to Kubernetes just yet, right? Because uh, having a pod with a 50 terabytes of data and, you know, like many, many terabytes of run and so on, so that is not a very good pattern for, uh, uh, for uh, Kubernetes, right? You want to move uh, uh, the data out there which fits, uh, uh, fits well, and uh, uh, let's face it, uh, while there is a significant progress uh, made over the last years, right, not every uh, database for every use case is best fit for, uh, 
uh, the Kubernetes use case well. The next one is to use appropriate node sizes for uh, Kubernetes. One thing I have seen with uh, uh, Kubernetes deployment, people use like relatively small node size VMs because they're saying, hey, you know what? We are deploying relatively small web apps, right? So we don't need kind of like a big uh, chance. But you know what? I in a database, you may want them to be uh, uh, larger. Why I don't recommend deploying five terabytes. Well, you know, maybe deploying terabyte database and having, uh, you know, like a, a half a terabyte of memory, right, or 256 gigs, like 32 cores, right, or something. That is uh, quite reasonable, and that's what your database instance one uh, wants to consume, right? But it obviously needs to have a uh, node time to um, to support that. The next one. Uh, in production, you want to configure resource requests and, uh, and limits. And I think this is an important one, like, uh, for, and many people m kind of moving from VMs to containers don't really uh, understand uh, that, right? Because when you deploy VM, typically you have this amount of memory, right? This amount of CPU cores, and it's kind of uh, quite fixed, right? Or you kind of get VM in the cloud. If you have uh, the container, deployed, right, it will use uh, up to all resources available uh, on the node. And uh, that can be, you know, problematic, uh, right, be between uh, different applications, different database nodes uh, uh, competing for resources, right? In development, that may be fine. In production, you often want predictability, so you want to make sure saying, hey, my database container is uh, fix it to this amount of resources, so I get like a uniform performance. And if somebody else running their workloads on the same Kubernetes cluster, hopefully I have a minimum impact to my database performance. The next one is use proper uh, anti-affinity, right? That is another uh, interesting, uh, interesting thing, right? Because uh, if, you, uh, if you don't, you may end up to have all, let's say, cluster of a free database node all placed on VMs uh, on the same physical server. Not a good idea, right? Or maybe if you have an uh, environment with multiple you know, racks, you may set uh, uh, affinity with a different uh, racks, right? So if there is some, I don't know, let's say, uh, a uh, sin uh, whole rack fa fails because of power right or something, then uh, you have uh, uh, availability mm, set up, right? And I think that is, a, uh, th that is an uh, important thing for you know, the databases. Next thing is tuning your database. Kubernetes may be magical, but it's not going to tune the database for you. All the good database practices are still, uh, uh, still apply. Right in this case, and that applies to the database configuration, making sure you follow the good schema design practices, tune your queries, and so on, uh, and so on and so forth. Right uh, to, uh, to get uh, get that. Now uh, here I will maybe mention a little uh, plug of uh, Percona tool, uh, we have, which is an open source tool called Percona Monitoring Management, which helps among other things to understand what are the most important queries and uh, how, you know, what is their performance and how to, uh, to fix them. Works with Kubernetes or a database uh, everywhere and open source, as I mentioned, so you can, uh, you can use that to uh, get your database. Next one is uh, uh, scaling. Right, of course, as your uh, the workload uh, grows, you may not be uh, wanting to rely uh, or rely on a performance uh, of a single uh, of a single node. So how do we want to uh, to scale? And that really depends on databases. Some databases say, hey, you know what? You, we can split them to get like a read write uh, uh, read write uh, split right to scale reads. In other databases, they support sharding and some sort of like really or active active cluster. And you want to understand that because that uh, also defines how large databases uh, you can put on Kubernetes, right? And uh, how much uh, really traffic they can um, uh, they can support. Next one is uh, control eviction pod priorities, right? Well, the thing of databases, even kind of in the best uh, case, it's still. 
uh, take some time, uh, right, to uh, uh, to uh, recreate that forward, right? Database often need to, at very least, kind of warm up to uh, warm up to get the data in the cache to achieve optimal performance and so on and so forth, right? So you want uh, Kubernetes to to go easy on killing the database pods, <laughs> right, and uh, rescheduling of something, right? Uh, of course, it needs to happen, and the operator should take care of that if, uh, if limiting the performance impact, but at the same time, you uh, want to minimize that. And that one is making sure you don't expose your database outside of a Kubernetes cluster unless you have to. And if you expose it to other applications running in your network outside of that cluster, make sure it's in, at least it's not exposed in the public, because guess what? That is a very uh, common issue of a data losses when databases get accidentally exposed in the, uh, to the internet. The next one is, of course, uh, enable encryption, right? A good idea to make sure you encrypt the data uh, both uh, at rest uh, and uh, uh, in uh, transit. You know, uh, TLS is quite uh, inexpensive these days if you set up, it, uh, set up it right, right? So it's better to uh, have it going, right, even if it's inside the network of uh, uh, your control. Also, for uh, sh uh, sh having the infer uh, access details passed between application, you can use uh, Kubernetes uh, secrets, which are uh, a fantastic, uh, the fantastic solution, right, which uh, can help uh, to uh, reduce the credentials uh, uh, exposure. And there are a lot of uh, operators uh, which uh, integrate with, uh, well, typically good operators are going to integrate with Kubernetes uh, secrets and provide that kind of map into uh, the database. Backups, of course, don't forget your backups because, uh, especially with Kubernetes, uh, uh, have a kind of high risk to lose your data because of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, operator mistakes. So uh, make sure to have them. And remember, even if you have like um, five node cluster in multiple geographical locations, it's not replacement of backups, right? Because somebody may still just, you know, log in and drop a table intentionally or unintentionally, right, or trash your data in a way that you need to uh, restore on backups. So the last one I would mention is consider new generation databases. There are some databases which are designed to run on that cloud native infrastructure, run exactly on Kubernetes. They typically are uh, designed with a sharding, right, scaling across many nodes, horizontal scalability in, uh, uh, in mind. Right, and uh, especially for large scale environments where it can be fantastic, right? I think what is interesting here is there are a bunch of solutions which exist right now which are, uh, which are open source, right? They are not as uh, popular yet as Postgres or uh, MySQL, but they are growing rapidly. Okay, now let's uh, cover in a few words what is going on besides the uh, Kubernetes uh, operators, right? So as we uh, spoke, Kubernetes operators are wonderful in terms of reducing toil, similar to database as a service, but for many people, UX can be different, right? You say somebody saying, well, you know what? I want to deploy the database and manage that with a couple of clicks. Well, Kubernetes operators, right, require you to do things a little bit differently, right? Uh, and that is where we are working on uh, uh, open source replacement, right, the functionality for database as a service uh, in, uh, uh, the, in the PMM, right? Uh, I think uh, the, what besides us, there are probably going to be more work uh, getting to that, right, as well often happens with open source. There is often, you know, many people working on some uh, high uh, value uh, solutions. So at this point, that is uh, like a preview, preview functionality, right? It's not GA yet, but well, uh, you know, check it out, provide the feedback, or maybe even some code. And uh, you can even uh, check out this, right, where you can, you, you know, get the things, all, uh, all the things uh, deployed to play with uh, without needing to uh, 
mess with your Kubernetes operator installation and so on and so forth. Well, with that, that's uh, uh, all I, uh, I had. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I would be uh, happy to answer them, but I think we'll need to start allowing the next speaker to set up. Is the next speaker here? No, yet? Well, uh, he's lost, right? So you can, uh, you can <laughs> start asking questions. Yes? What's the state of Galera on Kubernetes? Well, uh, what is the state of Galera on, uh, on Kubernetes, right? So uh, we at uh, uh, Pircona have a, a Pircona XRB cluster, which is Galera-based, right? That is what we use for a replication, because Galera is indeed very, uh, designed very well to work on Kubernetes. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, well, if not, then uh, uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate it. You know, run of, uh, you know, run open source, including databases. Yeah.